Hi everyone, welcome back to Learn with Med Nuggets. Today we're going to learn about cardiomyopathy. There are three types of cardiomyopathy dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. In this video, we will talk about each of their causes, diagnosis, and treatment. Let's start with dilated cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy is a systolic dysfunction due to dilation of the heart chambers. The most important causes of dilated cardiomyopathy are use of alcohol, chronic cocaine use, drugs like doxorubicin, Coxsackie B virus, Chagas disease, and a condition called beriberi that occurs due to thiamine deficiency, peripartum cardiomyopathy, which occurs during pregnancy, Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, which is as a result of loss of a loved one or trauma, and tachycardic cardiomyopathy. However, the etiology of dilated cardiomyopathy is mostly idiopathic. In dilated cardiomyopathy, there is an eccentric hypertrophy. Therefore, the diameter of the heart chambers are increased. When the heart chambers are dilated, it will reduce the contractility of the heart muscles and then the stroke volume and cardiac output will also decrease. So dilated cardiomyopathy is a systolic dysfunction because the heart is unable to contract and push blood out. So the patient will present with features of left and right heart failure. Left heart failure features include pulmonary edema, so the patient will experience paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea and orthopnea. Right heart failure features include hepatomegaly and pedal edema. So, in dilated cardiomyopathy, due to the increased diameter, more blood will fill the ventricles during diastole, and the turbulence that is caused by this large volume of blood will result in a S3 heart sound. Also, when the chambers are dilated, it will pull apart the leaflets of the mitral and tricuspid valves. So you, there will be a mitral and tricuspid regurgitation murmurs as well. The diagnosis of all types of cardiomyopathy is by echo, chest x-ray and ECG. And the most important investigation is the echo. The echo in dieter cardiomyopathy will show a decrease in the thickness of the wall, an increase in chamber diameter, an increase in ventricular compliance because the diameter of the chambers are high so more blood can fill the ventricles during diastole, and a decrease in ejection fraction. And like I said before, there will also be a mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. The chest x-ray will show features of cardiomegaly and pulmonary edema. So what are the features of pulmonary edema? There are five important features of pulmonary edema. You can remember this with a simple mnemonic A, B, C, D and E. A is for alveolar edema. This will be seen as a bat wing sign. And B is for curly B lines. This is due to the fluid in the fissures. C is for cardiomegaly. That is, the width of the heart will be more than 50% of the thoracic width in a chest x-ray film. D is for upper lobe diversion. This is due to the pulmonary vein engorgement. And lastly, E is for fluoral effusion, so the costophrenic angle will be blurry. In ECG, there will be features of atrial fibrillation and atrial tachycardia. The treatment of dieted cardiomyopathy involves decreasing the preload and decreasing the afterload. So to decrease the preload, we have to restrict fluid intake and also to give diuretics. To decrease the afterload, and therefore increase the stroke volume. We know that afterload is inversely proportional to the stroke volume. So if we decrease the afterload, we can increase the stroke volume. So we decrease the afterload with drugs like AC inhibitors, ARBs, hydrolazine, and isosorbide dinitrate. Also, it is very important to remember that AC inhibitors and ARBs are contraindicated in pregnancy. And like I said before, in dieter cardiomyopathy, the contraction of the ventricles is less. So we have to increase the muscle contractility to increase the stroke volume. So we use drugs like digoxin to increase the muscle contractility. If the patient has features of ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation, then we have to defibrillate the patient. And also because this patient have a risk of developing atrial fibrillation, atrial tachycardia, this can increase the risk of embolus formation and stroke. 
So we also have to give anticoagulants like warfarin. In refractory cases of dieter cardiomyopathy, the only option is a heart transplant. Moving on to the next type, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a diastolic dysfunction, not a systolic dysfunction like dilated cardiomyopathy. This diastolic dysfunction is due to asymmetric hypertrophy of the interventricular septum. And the hypertrophy of the interventricular septum will be mostly directed to the left side of the heart. So the left chambers of the heart will be most affected in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Etiology of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is mostly genetic. It can be an autosomal dominant condition called hypertrophic cardi obstructive cardiomyopathy. This is due to a mutation of the heavy chain of myosin protein and an autosomal recessive condition called Friedrich ataxia. Friedrich ataxia is a triad of neurological symptoms, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and diabetes mellitus. The asymmetric concentric hypertrophy that is seen in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will decrease the diameter of the left chambers. Therefore, during diastolic filling, the ventricles will not be able to occupy a lot of blood. So the preload will be decreased. When the preload decreases, the stroke volume and cardiac output will also decrease. A decrease in cardiac output will decrease the systemic perfusion and the coronary perfusion. Also, when the interventricular septum contracts, this will narrow the left ventricular outflow tract. So the mitral valve will be squashed. We call this the Venturi effect. And you will see a systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. This can be seen in the echo in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the atrium must work extra hard to push blood to these narrow ventricles. So there will be an atrial kick that will produce an S4 hard sound. And like I said before, because of the Venturi effect and because of the systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve, there will be mitral regurgitation murmurs as well. And because blood must be pushed through the narrow left ventricular outflow tract, you will hear an ejection systolic murmur like in aortic stenosis. But the difference is that the murmur will not radiate to the carotids like in aortic stenosis. The diagnosis of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In the echo, you will see an increase in the wall thickness because of the hypertrophy, an increase in ejection fraction, a decrease in diameter of the chambers and decrease in the compliance and a systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve due to the venturi effect. The chest x-ray in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is normal. ECG findings involve atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardias, ventricular fibrillation, left ventricular hypertrophy, and most importantly, pseudo Q waves, particularly in LEDs 2, 3, and AVF. The treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should be directed at decreasing the murmur. We decrease the murmur by decreasing the obstruction. So how do we decrease the obstruction? We decrease the obstruction by keeping the ventricles filled with blood. That is, we have to keep the chambers more dilated to decrease the obstruction. We do this by increasing the preload and increasing the afterload. So if a patient squats, this will increase the venous return to the heart and therefore will increase the preload. But if we do a Valsava maneuver on patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this will increase the intrathoracic pressure and therefore decrease the venous return to the heart and decrease the preload, which will increase the obstruction and increase the intensity of the murmur. Also, to in keep the preload increase, we have to make sure that these patients are not dehydrated. To increase the afterload, if we do things like hand grips, this will increase the systemic vascular resistance and increase the afterload. But using certain vasodilators like AC inhibitors, ARBs, these will reduce the afterload. So vasodilators should be avoided in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And also, we have to decrease the contractility of the heart because when the contractility is high, then this will further obstruct the left ventricular outflow tract. 
So we have to decrease the contractility with the use of calcium channel blockers and beta blockers. And drugs like digoxin should be avoided. If the above medical treatment doesn't work, then myomectomy and alcohol ablation can be done. One important point to remember is that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in young athletes can result in sudden cardiac death. Why do you think so this happens? Because young athletes, they often practice a lot. So there will be an increase in the contractility of the heart. And also they don't keep themselves hydrated enough because they are always practicing. So this increase in contraction and dehydration will result in severe narrowing of the ventricles because the preload will be decreased and increase in contraction will further obstruct the left ventricle outflow tract. Then this can result in sudden cardiac death. Moving on to the last type of cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is a diastolic dysfunction due to fibrosis and infiltration of the cardiac tissue. Just like in dieter cardiomyopathy, the etiology of restrictive cardiomyopathy is also mostly idiopathic. Other causes can be radiation, amyloidosis, sarcoidosis, and hemochromatosis, which you can remember with a simple mnemonic rash. Due to the fibrosis and infiltration of the heart chambers, of the heart muscle, there will be a decrease in diastolic filling because the heart muscle will be so stiff it will not be able to dilate during the diastolic phase. And because of the decreased diastolic filling, your preload will decrease and then your stroke volume and cardiac output will also decrease, resulting in a left and right heart failure. An important point to remember is that restrictive cardiomyopathy will result in right heart failure more than left heart failure. So in restrictive cardiomyopathy, in the early diastole period, there will be a sudden gush of blood from the atria to ventricles. This is because there will be a lot of blood in the atria because the ventricles cannot hold a lot of blood due to the fibrosis. So in the early diastole period, all of the blood that is in the atria will, push, will be pushed to the ventricles and this will produce an S3 gallop sound. But in the mid or late diastole period, there will be an increase in pressure in the ventricles and will not be able to hold more blood from the atria. So the atria will be filled with blood and the atria dilates and this dilation of the atria will stretch the leaflets of the mitral and tricuspid valves just like in diarrhea cardiomyopathy resulting in a mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Also in restrictive cardiomyopathy due to the fibrosis during inspiration blood will not be able to flow back to the left to the right heart chambers so you will see a jugular venous distension and cosmal breathing. The diagnosis of restrictive cardiomyopathy in the echo, there will be a decrease in the compliance. You will see mitral and tricuspid regurgitation. Ejection fraction will be normal. And the wall thickness and the chamber diameter, it varies. But if there is a change in the chamber diameter, it will be mostly symmetric, not asymmetric. The chest x-ray in restrictive cardiomyopathy is normal. The ECG, you will see atrial fibrillation. And also because of the fibrosis and infiltration of the AV nodes and the buddles, you will see an AV block and buddle branch blocks. The treatment of restrictive cardiomyopathy is by gently decreasing the preload and gently decreasing the afterload. So we gently decrease the preload by fluid restriction and diuretics. We gently decrease the afterload with drugs like AC inhibitors, ARBs, hydrolyzine and isosorbide dinitrate. And in refractory cases, it's heart transplant. So that's the end of our lesson on cardiomyopathy. Hope you learned something. If you did, please like, comment and subscribe to our channel. Bye-bye.